Now starting, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome. My name is Michelle Dixon, and I am the Program and Development Director for Massachusetts Breast Cancer Coalition. I'd like to thank you all for joining us today for this important topic, crowdsourced biomonitoring, measuring chemical body burdens in a population of concerned consumers. I am pleased to welcome today's speaker, Dr. Robin Dotson. Dr. Dotson is a research scientist at Silent Spring Institute with expertise in exposure assessment, particularly in the indoor environment. Her research focuses on three main areas, development of novel exposure measurements for epidemiological and community-based studies, analysis of environmental exposure data with a particular emphasis on semi-volatile organic compounds such as phthalates and flame retardant chemicals, and intervention studies aimed at reducing chemical exposures. Dr. Dotson manages Silent Springs Detox Me Action Kit, a biomonitoring study of consumer product chemical exposures. She completed her doctorate work at Harvard T.H. Chan School for Public Health and has been at Silent Spring Institute for over a decade. Dr. Dotson, welcome thank and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Um, I'm excited to be here and I'm excited to share some of our research today um, talking about consumer product chemical exposures um, and our body burdens associated with these chemicals. Um, so first I want to talk a little bit about our evidence that we have that some of these chemicals are not only in our environment but also in our bodies. Oops. Uh, several years ago now, we did some product testing work where we were trying to identify what are some common hormone disrupting chemicals and asthma associated chemicals in everyday products. This product testing work um, arose because we knew from our, uh, our household exposure studies, so our studies of looking at indoor air and house dust, that many chemicals that we considered to be consumer product chemicals were in our homes. Um, we saw this way back in about 20 years ago now on Cape Cod and have seen them in subsequent studies. We were interested in trying to follow up on our hypothesis that many of these chemicals that we're measuring in the indoor space are actually coming from the products that we use every day and hence our product testing work. This product testing work was uh, done because we uh, first, actually tried to figure out if we could contact companies to ask them what chemicals are in everyday products, and we didn't get very far. It's also that the labels on several consumer products, especially things like household cleaners, are incomplete or limited. So as a result, we were left with having to test the products chemically ourselves for the chemicals that we were concerned about. This product testing study focused on products that we considered both to be conventional, so those based on market share are products that we believe that people are typically using. Um, we also looked at products that we called alternative products. Those are products that we believed based on their product labeling to have limited chemicals of concern. We tested these two, over 200 uh, products and found that endocrine disrupting chemicals, those chemicals that interfere with our hormone system, are widespread and you would, ubiquitous in many of the products that we use. So we know that these products are, or these chemicals rather, that we're concerned about are in the products that we use every day. These chemicals also make their way into our bodies. So we're following this along the chain of understanding first the sources and then understanding of whether or not those chemicals are actually getting into our bodies. This is data from uh, the National Biomonitoring Program that is run by CDC. Um, the CDC is called NHANES, and we're looking at data for several consumer product chemicals here um, that were measured in 2013 to 2014. And you can see here that Almost 100% of Americans, almost all of us, have these chemicals in our body. Um, and they are widespread. We have chemicals like methylparaben in nearly every American, chemicals like uh, bisphenol A or BPA, chemicals like 2,5-DCP, which is a metabolite of uh, 
carcinogenic chemical that is often used in things like mothballs or toilet bowl deodorizers. So these chemicals are in the products we use and they're in our bodies. But unfortunately, not everyone is exposed equally. We can see a fair amount of variability in our exposure to these chemicals across the population. And when we dig in further, and this is looking at, specifically looking at methylparaben as measured in urine for different uh, race and ethnicities, we can see that um, non-Hispanic blacks have significantly higher levels um, of, this is for methylparaben, than, for example, non-Hispanic whites. So there's a disparity in our exposures. To try to understand why this might be happening and what might be driving some of these exposure disparities, we extended our product testing work to focus specifically on chemicals that might be uniquely used by non-Hispanic black women. Those are hair products that are marketed towards and commonly used by black women. This is a paper that uh, we published last year, um, and it's led by uh, uh, Jessica Helm. So why did we want to study hair products for black women? Well, trying to understand a little bit more about these exposure disparities can help us understand more about the sources of these chemicals. The variability in exposure and the differences we see in exposure across the population provide us with evidence that there are differences in sources. And so this is one hypothesized difference in the sources that might be leading to these exposure disparities for these common chemicals that are considered to be hormone disruptors. So black women unfortunately suffer or have a greater burden of several hormone related health problems, most notably uterine fibroids, infertility, preterm birth, early puberty, and also we're seeing increasing rates of breast cancer and endometrial cancers. We know from the national biomonitoring data that they have more personal care product chemicals in their bodies. And we know based on survey work that there are some unique or different products that they may be using than other women. So we conducted the first study to look at uh, hair products used by black women. We uh, focused on 18 different types of hair products, including those that are marketed towards children. And we identified these products for testing based on a survey of over 300 um, African-American, Afri African-Caribbean, and Hispanic and white women in New York City that was done uh, several years ago by our colleague, uh, Tamara James Todd, who is now faculty at Harvard. So just like with our earlier product testing work where we looked um, at hormone disrupting and asthma associated chemicals in the products themselves, these hair products were tested for those same chemicals. We focused on group uh, chemicals like alkaphenols, cyclosiloxanes, ethanolamines, fragrances, parabens, phthalates, and UV filters. And here's a table showing the associated health effects, again, looking at their literature, mostly based on laboratory evidence. So that's looking at animal studies or even cellular studies, identifying the potential health effects of these chemicals, and also identifying the products in which we found these chemicals. So for example, cyclosiloxanes are commonly found in anti-frizz, leave-in conditioner, hair relaxer, root stimulator, and hot oil treatments. Of the 66 chemicals that we looked at, again, these are mostly endocrine disrupting chemicals or asthma associated chemicals. We found 45 or detected 45 of the target chemicals. We found in each product multiple EDCs or endocrine disrupting chemicals, ranging between four chemicals to up to 30 of our target chemicals in each product. Some concentrations were higher compared to others products. What that means is that we've compared some of these hair products that are marketed and used by black women compared to hair products that we had tested previously and found concentrations for some of the chemicals to be higher than our previous hair product testing. We also found that seven chemicals that we were detecting are either regulated by California or banned in, the, in Europe, the EU, um, or restricted in some way. Um, 
And unfortunately, the highest levels of five of these regulated chemicals were found in hair relaxers that are marketed towards children. The most common chemicals that were found are parabens. These are the parabens, methyl parabens specifically was the, was the chemical that I highlighted earlier looking at the national biomonitoring data. Um, we know that parabens, uh, that Americans are uh, uh, ubiquitously exposed to parabens. Um, it is not surprising that there would be um, very common in these products. 78% contained either uh, paraben or diethyl phthal uh, phthalate, which is typically considered to be a solvent for fragrance. This is consistent what we, with what we see in the national biomonitoring data, showing the disparities in exposure across race and ethnic groups. Hair lotions had the highest levels of paraben concentrations, and all products contained a fragrance chemical. The, con the chemical that we found at the highest concentration were the cyclosiloxanes. In fact, almost half that product is cyclosiloxane for anti-frizz products. We did not find these cyclosiloxanes in hair lotions. We also found, unfortunately, that many of the ingredients weren't labeled. Um, and this was a follow-up of, of work that we had done in our previous product testing where we did a label analysis. And again, finding that parabens and fragrance appear more often on the label, and they appear more often when they're at higher concentrations, but 84% of the detected chemicals that we found were not on the ingredient label. And that's due to certain different regulations around uh, product labeling. It could also be that they are not intentionally added chemicals, but they're introduced, say, in third-party supplies um, or even from the packaging. In other words, I think there's a lack of information or lack of transparency about what some of the, if some of these chemicals are present in the products themselves, and the manufacturers might not even know. This is part of some a kind of a larger research work that we are doing um, looking at exposure disparities. Um, and this was a, there was a nice article written by my colleagues, Amizoda and Bhavna Shamasander, um, that it was looking at beauty products and thinking about our exposure to chemicals and beauty products and the environmental health disparities um, resulting from, from product use. So here, our hair relax, our hair, sorry, our hair testing is focused on some of the um, uh, the external factors that are related to hair texture preference. It's this kind of Eurocentric notion of beauty that are basically compelling certain women to use products to live up to those standards. But this is not just you know, hair products, we could think about colorism, that's those certain parts of the population that might be using skin lightening creams, and also odor discrimination. Again, finding disparities in the use of some products are driving some of the exposure disparities, and research is ongoing to look to see if these are related to the health disparities that we also see. So I want to present this and this idea that this is part of a larger kind of issue around um, beauty and beauty norms, um, and that our identification of trying to think about where some of these sources might be uh, for some of these observed exposure disparities is really important if we want to deal um, with some of these kind of structural issues around racism or justice related to um, product use among different subsets of the society. So this work, our product testing work, including their hair testing work, is what has led us to develop a program that we call Detox Me Action Kit. It is a crowdsourced biomonitoring program uh, for consumer product chemicals. This program was started in late December 2016 and is ongoing. Um, we have had over 800 people sign up to date to take part. What it means by being a crowdsourced biomonitoring program is that most biomonitoring programs, including CDC's biomonitoring program, people cannot enroll themselves. But we know, based on years of people reaching out to us, that people are very interested in understanding their personal body burdens of many of these chemicals. And so to kind of heed that, or to, under, to kind of meet that need, rather, we started this biomonitoring program. 
it's crowdsourced in that the participants or those that might support them in some way are financially supporting the project itself. The, the cost of basically being involved in the project covers the analytical costs as well as the results reporting. Um, but this is a way that opens up biomonitoring to all those um, who might be interested in learning more about their biomonitor or their body burdens. So once somebody signs up on our uh, website, they uh, will then go through an informed consent process. And once they've consented to participate, they will receive a kit in the mail. Um, and in each kit, there are uh, two urine collection cups, as well as instructions, and a link to an online survey. The idea here is that at people's leisure, they can collect urine samples. We ask that people collect two different urine samples, one of which they should collect um, in, an, in the evening and then the next in the following morning. That idea is that it's then supposed to be representative of their kind of overall kind of 24 hour exposure. Um, and this is clearly marked in the instructions. And then once they've collected their urine, we ask them to complete a survey. And the survey is focused on some behaviors um, or products that they may have used in the previous 24 hours that could help us understand what might be leading to their results or their subsequent um, levels of these chemicals in their bodies. So as we're developing a biomonitoring program, the question becomes, what chemicals should we focus on? CDC's National Biomonitoring Program focuses on over 200 different chemicals. They look both in blood and in urine. And now we were doing a crowdsourced biomonitoring program where we wanted people to collect the, the samples themselves, so that meant that blood was off the table. So instead, we're focused on chemicals that could be reasonably um, and accurately measured in urine. What that means is that we're focusing on chemicals, typically, because that's how kind of the, the chemical properties dictate where these chemicals end up, are, prop, are chemicals that are, tend to have shorter half-lives. That means they spend less time in our body. So we are focusing just by looking at chemicals that are measured in urine, essentially, by looking at chemicals that can have half-lives on days to you know maybe a week or so. That means that any action that somebody might take, they could change the levels in their urine um, fairly quickly. So that's enticing because it means that people can alter their or have some sort of control over their body burdens. Further, we wanted to understand um, a little bit more about some of the, um, the results that we had seen in our product testing. Um, where we've seen parabens um, commonly found in many of these products. So product testing indicates that these chemicals, specifically parabens, benzophenone 3, which is a UV filter, and triclosan are commonly found in products and that they are more often on product labels than many of the other chemicals that we tested for. And that is for a couple of reasons. One is that parabens are widely used, but they tend to be intentionally added because they're preservatives commonly used in things like cosmetics or lotions. BP3, um, benzophenone 3, uh, also known as oxybenzone, is also commonly on the label because it is a UV filter. It, it is an active ingredient, so it must be labeled in many products. Triclosan is the same idea. Triclosan is an antimicrobial or antibacterial chemical. It is added to things like toothpaste, deodorant, and previously been added to things like hand washing before the FDA had come out with a recommendation or actually a ban of triclosan saying that regular hand washing or hand washing with regular soap and water is just as effective as using antibacterial hand soap. So it was it typically though triclosan is typically on a product label because it has a certain property that makes it the active ingredient in that product. So you might find it on your toothpaste for example. We also know based on research, our own and others, that product use correlates with exposure. What I mean by that is that studies have shown that, say, for example, the more um, lotion and deodorant and makeup that you use, the more, the higher your levels of things like parabens. Same goes for things like bisphenols, like BPA. 
um, the more canned food you eat, um, the more the higher levels that you'll have of BPA. Many of these chemicals have, have been shown in some small-scale intervention studies. These include intervention studies like the one um, out in California that was done with Latina teens. It's called the Hermosa study. That study um, enrolled Latina teens to um, switch their beauty products over several days with products that, that were labeled as free of things like parabens, benzophenone 3, um, and benzophenone 3. And they showed that over uh, by switching, their products that they could significantly reduce their exposure to things like parabens and benzophenone 3. Our own work a couple years ago showed that switching to a fresh food, di fresh food diet could substantially reduce exposure to, to chemicals like BPA um, just over a period of, of three or four days. So interventions have been shown to, to reduce the levels, which means that people's actions can reduce uh, their exposure, limit their exposures. All of these, when we look at the biomonitoring data, particularly from CDC, show a fair amount of variability. What that means is that there's lots of variation, orders of magnitude. What means is that some people have levels as low as, say, one nanogram per milliliter, and some people have levels as high as 1,000 nanograms per liter, milliliter. What that means is that we're not all exposed to the same thing and the same amount all the time, right? Our sources are not the same or not constant. What that means is that we have unique or different sources of these chemicals. And to me, what that means is that we can then identify those sources and start eliminating them. And we should see changes in the distribution of exposure. In particular, we know that that happens across different demographics or subgroups. And this is really important because it, it, it kind of provides opportunities for limiting exposures. So if we can identify what is driving those levels so much higher in a certain subpopulation, then by reducing that, we should be able to draw those levels right back down. Basically, what this comes down to is that all of these chemicals, parabens, this phenyl, uh, sorry, BP, uh, BP3, which is benzophenone 3, triclosan, bisphenols, and dichlorophenols are all considered to be actionable. They have short half-lives, they can easily be measured in urine, and based on previous research, we know that changing behaviors in some way can lead to changes in exposure. So up until February 23rd, 2018, we were, had launched our program. We were about a year into the program. Um, we had about 300 people enrolled um, and we were analyzing their urines. And then Nick Kristoff of the New York Times um, did our test and wrote about it in February of 2018. What this meant was that we got considerable attention to our research program and our, uh, our number of participants effectively doubled within a month or so, um, which was great. Um, he really drew attention to the idea that we have common consumer product chemicals, many of which are considered to be hormone disruptors, which means that they may be associated with, with diseases like breast cancer in our bodies, and highlighted the idea that they are coming from these products that we could identify, if we could only identify what those products are, what the sources of these chemicals are, we could take steps to limit our exposures. So now I want to summarize what we're finding in our study. Um, so this is a table where we're summarizing who is participating. So we have, to date, we have urine data, or urine, from 726 participants that have been analyzed chemically. We have both survey and urine data from 575 participants. All of this is voluntary. People are self-enrolling, and so we do have a less, uh, we have a lower number of survey response than we do people who gave their urine. Um, so what did we find? Well, who do we have in our study, I should say? Um, most are female. Most are between, uh, or older than 30 years, I should say. 
We did start enrolling children. That is actually a unique feature of our study compared to most biomonitoring programs, and in particular CDC's biomonitoring program, is that we can enroll everyone of any age, um, so including children, including infants, um, where CDC only starts collecting urine from children at least six years of age. So this is the only option for um, much younger children. We can see that most of our participants are, are highly educated. 64% um, have a graduate degree. And most at this point are non-Hispanic white, although we are um, working on um, trying to diversify our uh, sample, making our uh, sample, making our kit available to a broader audience. Well, the, the most uh, common uh, state that uh, of participants is Massachusetts. Um, this is a national study. We can do it anywhere in the 48 um, U.S. states, contingent, uh, continuous 48 states, um, where Massachusetts is the first most common, um, followed by New York and California. We have a fair amount of West Coast participants. So what did we find? Well, everyone in our study of the 726 had, <coughs> with urine data, have, has methylparaben and benzophenone 3. This is pretty similar to what they see in the national uh, biomonitoring. Um, so everybody has something in, in their bodies. Most people had at least seven chemicals in their bodies. Um, but you can see that that is, it varies according across the number of participants. Um, that of the 10 chemicals that we were focused on, um, that very few could have uh, just two or three or four chemicals in their bodies. Now let's compare our data to that national biomonitoring data that I was just talking about. So this is our DMAC, that's what we call the Detox Me Action Kit. So the Detox Me Action Kit participants here are shown in blue and they're being compared to NHANES, that's the national biomonitoring data in orange here. These are box plots, so what they're showing are the percentiles. Basically 50% of the values are gonna fall within that box that the dark line in the very middle of the box, or in the, in the box, is the 50th percentile. So if we're looking at those 50th percentile lines, um, you can see that there are differences between our study population and the national data. Now what I did is I actually pulled this apart a little bit to try to actually show, I just told you that we predominantly have mostly white women in our study. So what I wanted to do, since NHANES is more diverse than our study at present, what I did is I actually now subset to just looking at white women both in our study and in the national biomonitoring data. And I want to highlight a couple of, of differences that I see when I look at this. The first is that parabens, this is just showing methylparaben, but the same is true for propylparaben, another common paraben. Um, parabens tend to be much lower in our study population compared to the NHANES or National Biomonitoring data. You can see this also for triclosan. Again, our participants are substantially lower in body burdens compared to the national data uh, for white women um, and on, on whole um, for, for the chemical triclosan. And let's look at the bisphenol. So bisphenol A, BPA, that's common, that's probably one of the most common chemicals you might hear about, um, is found in things like polycarbonate plastics, so hard plastics, as well as epoxy uh, resins, or what, that is like lining of cans. It has many kind of what we call chemical cousins, chemicals that look an awful lot like BPA, but they switch, say, um, one part of the molecule. Um, so that is technically a different chemical, although behaves very similar in our body. So BPA is acts like estrogen in our body. And when you, um, when you change the structure of BPA slightly so that you create things like BPF or BPS, um, these chemical cousins, the health effects are shown to be actually fairly simil similar. They act very similar um, because they're pretty much the same structure. Um, their uses are fairly similar as well. So in our 
detox me action kit, we are looking at BPA and what we call two of its chemical cousins, BPF and BPS. So what I want to show here is that on, on whole, our, our, our detox me action kit participants are generally lower than the national biomonitoring data for things like BPA. Not so for BPF. In fact, the DMAC participants are, are much, much higher than uh, those that we see in the national biomonitoring data. And our BPS levels are fairly similar. Um, this is really interesting to me because it's showing, I think, at least on face, that there might be some sort of substitution going on here or preferential picking, it kind of, un, or maybe not even realizing it, of kind of switching to some of these chemical cousins um, that somehow reflected in our population. More on that in just a little bit. So one thing that's different about our study is that we um, have participants that, and as the title of this presentation would suggest, or we would call generally concerned, um, they're generally aware of chemicals in their bodies. I mean, this is right, the idea is that they're generally aware that these chemicals exist, but they may be of health concern. This is not surprising, right? These people are signing up for a biomonitoring study. Sometimes they're paying or somebody's paying on their behalf to participate. They read an article in the New York Times and then they want to learn more. So they're generally kind of aware of these issues. And we know this because we ask people in the survey whether or not they typically avoid, say, products that contain BPA or bisphenol A, or whether or not they avoid products that have parabens on the label. And in fact, you can see 82% of our participants report that they avoid BPA. 65 percent avoid parabens, 65 percent avoid triclosan, and 65 percent avoid fragrances. And I should say it's not the same 65, it just happens that the numbers work out that way, um, that avoid those parabens, triclosan, and fragrances. In fact, 41 percent of people in our study report avoiding all four chemical groups. That's a fairly kind of aware or concerned consume, uh, participant base there. So now we were really interested in whether or not those, the body burdens themselves might vary according to whether or not people try to avoid um, the products, uh, the chemicals rather. So here what I'm showing are the distributions for three parabens, ethylparaben, methylparaben, and propylparaben. These are the urine concentrations by, and I'm looking at whether or not people have stated they either avoid or do not avoid. So avoid parabens, no, that's on the left-hand side of each of these, and avoid parabens, yes, that's on the right-hand side. What this is, note the log scale. So some of these differences don't look as big as, as you might first expect. The parabens, avoiding parabens are stating that you choose to avoid products that contain parabens on the labels results in significantly lower concentrations of parabens in, the, in, in, in their bodies. Um, so it would seem that uh, taking steps to avoid parabens is working. Um, what's interesting is that when we look at this for BPA, again, same setup here, where whether or not you avoid bisphenol A or BPA, no or yes, there is no difference necessarily or a very slight difference between those, uh, the body burdens of or bisphenol A concentrations in people compared to avoiders and non-avoiders. This is really interesting to think about whether what might be driving this. We have some hypotheses, some of which is around the idea is that BPA is probably the most common thing that people say that they avoid. Um, it is in our data, certainly, but um, if, pe if people have heard of a consumer product chemical they have probably heard of BPA. Um, and so there could be this general idea of maybe um, they feel like they should say that they avoid BPA. There also could be that people say they're avoiding BPA, but maybe they don't actually have a good understanding of where BPA is. Um, so they say they're avoiding it, but they don't know how to take effective steps to actually avoid it. Um, so we're looking into that a little bit more. Could also be that BPA is just it's there, but it's not well labeled, um, that it's in products that people don't even realize it's in. Um, and so again, this kind of misinformation or limited information about the actual sources of BPA. 
We did see, though, that drinking or eating out of a can increases BPA levels. This had been seen in, in some other studies. They were mostly controlled studies where they were looking at um, people who you know, would consume, say, a beverage out of a can and then measured their BPA before and after they did that and they could see increases. But we do see it. We did. We asked, did you eat or drink out of a can in the last 24 hours? If you answered yes to that, those people had significantly higher levels of BPA in their bodies. This is looking at um, the quartile of the number of personal care products used in the last 24 hours. What that means is that over there on the right, number four, that means that that's the top 25% of of, of people in terms of the number of products that they use. So that's people who are using more than like nine products that could contain, uh, that nine products of personal care products that could potentially contain parabens. And then all the way to the left there in blue, those are the people who use the least amount of products. And we can see a relationship between the number of personal care products that somebody uses and the methyl paraben concentrations. That is just straight up more pro more product use leads to higher concentrations. Um, and that had been seen um, in part uh, for, for parabens and, and also for things like uh, diethyl phthalate. Um, but again, even in this study, even in this study where we have people who are fairly, you know, they're taking steps to avoid these products, we can still see this trend towards greater product use is leading to higher levels. So a unique aspect of this study, something that the National Biomonitoring Program does not have and many others don't have yet, um, are that everybody who participated got a study result report if they wanted it. What that means is that after we, they sent us their urine samples, we sent those off to the lab for chemical analysis, we got the results back, we reviewed them for data quality, and then we generated personalized exposure reports. These personalized exposure reports were generated with a program or a tool that we developed with um, National Institutes of Health funding called DERBY, Digital Exposure Report Back Interface. And this is something that we have at Silent Spring have been developing over our years of research, um, thinking about how best to share data back with participants um, in an environmental health study. So every participant got something like this. This is a mock um, or example report that you can find on our website, for example. They would get highlights of what they, they found in their samples. For example, your sample had a higher level of A bisphenol than 95% of Americans. They would also get access to the overall study results so they could understand kind of the purpose or the overall kind of trend in what we were seeing with all of the data. And then you can see on the left there that you also get, they get um, personalized uh, results for each of the chemical types, but also tips on what you can do um, to try to reduce your levels. So I wanna show an example here. This is for, again, this is an example report where let's say your, your sample had a higher level of bisphenol S than 95% of Americans. Then the participant gets information about where these chemicals come from, what might these chemicals, why might these chemicals be of health concern? So what do we know based on the toxicological literature that's been published? Um, and how can you re reduce exposures? Um, so what are some of the tips, uh, recommendations um, for reducing exposure? These tips are all based in evidence. We have um, research back uh, tips only are, are presented in Derby here. Um, and they're more, they're not necessarily personalized, like this person may not um, be, you know, eating or not eating out of cans, but we say, you know, that can use in particular um, uh, has been associated with bisphenol um, A. Then if we move further down on that page, they get to their actual results. Everybody's here, their chemical levels, which is in this example report, is here in orange, and they can see their levels relative to everybody else in DMAC, or the Detoxing Action Kit study. Those are all the blue dots. And then they can see the US median and the US 95th percentile. Those are there to compare their data point to the national data. 
So, for example, you can see in this example that BPA levels or bisphenol A levels for this person were below or less than 50% of Americans. It was below the median. The bisphenol F levels were somewhere between the 50th percentile or the median and the 95th percentile, whereas the, this person had one of the highest levels of BPS in the study. So as I said in all the study results reports, they get, pers they get, sorry, they get recommendations for reducing their exposure. This is based on evidence um, and based on a lot of evidence that we've generated here at Silent Spring about what are the common sources uh, that we know of, of these chemicals. These recommendations are aggregated um, in our Detox Me app. This is a app that is free, available both for iOS, so that's Apple, and um, Android devices. And what it is is actually an aggregation of over 200 of our research-based tips. The idea here is that we conduct these studies and we typically would come up with kind of recommendations of you know, what people can do about it. And we had a lot of these recommendations and we had people who wanted you know, some way to access them all together. And so we made an app. Um, and that's our Detox Me app. You might notice the name, um, kind of parallel name structure here with both our app and our biomonitoring program because they're meant to be used together. The idea here is that you would look at some of the re recommendations in the app and then if you're really interested in whether or not uh, these chemicals are in your body um, and at what levels, then you could sign up for the Detox Me Action Kit. So I want to just highlight some kind of top take-home tips. Um, these are from the app. You can find these in the app as well as over 200 more tips. Um, the first tip is to look for paraben, phthalate, and fragrance-free products. The labeling on products, in particular for personal care products, things like cosmetics, is getting better. And often um, companies will see it as a marketing advantage to label their products as being paraben, free, phthalate free, or fragrance free. Um, so our recommendation is to, to try to choose those products. Um, fragrance free um, is important not only because uh, there are people that might be sensitive to fragrances, but fragrance is just a kind of a catch-all phrase that people use when they're describing it could be it could be catch all for maybe you know hundreds of chemicals in there, many of which oftentimes I should say includes things like phthalates. So choosing fragrance free products um, can avoid lots of chemicals um, by just going that route. Choose a quick drying nylon shower curtain instead of vinyl. This isn't necessarily coming out of our detox me action kit or a crowdsource by monitoring but a general idea is that I say avoid vinyl whenever possible. A vinyl in our product testing vinyl shower curtains are about a quarter 25 percent of that vinyl shower curtain is uh, at least in our testing we found to be a DEHP. DHP is one of the most potent phthalates and so 25 percent of that phthalate of that shower curtain rather could be this potent phthalate. So I'm often asked, what are kind of your top tips? I just try to avoid vinyl um, when, whenever possible. Opt for shade and a hat and choose chemical-free, what that means is mineral-based and non-nano, so non-nanoparticle sunscreen. Um, this is to avoid um, exposure to synthetic UV filters like benzophenone 3, benzophenone 3, as well as several other UV filters that's been shown to be estrogenic. We say eat more fresh foods instead of packaged foods. This is, helps with a lot of <laughs> chemical exposures. The first is bisphenol A or other bisphenols. Um, it um, also can reduce your exposure to phthalates that are found in plastics. So we saw that in our intervention study, um, our fresh food diet study a couple years ago. And more recently, are seeing this in our analysis of data related to uh, PFAS or highly fluorinated chemicals. These are the those kind of forever chemicals, those very highly persistent chemicals um, that we are studying um, found in contaminated water systems, but also in some consumer products. Um, but we know, unfortunately, that they're used in things like food wrappers. Um, and so choosing fresh food instead of packaged food will reduce your exposure to several chemicals of health concern. 
keep dust levels low with a damp cloth or a strong vacuum with a HEPA filter. HEPA filter is a, um, a filter that's going to grab those particles. It's a high efficiency particle um, filter. Um, and what that is important is because many of these chemicals um, that are found in consumer product chemicals end up in our dust. We know that because we study a lot of dust. I do a lot of vacuuming of people's homes and analyzing that dust to try to understand what people are exposed to. And we know that chemicals Hormone disruptors um, are found in dust. Um, so by basically reducing your exposure to dust, you can reduce your exposure to many of these chemicals that could be found in, in dust. And what I mean here by a damp cloth is not a chemically treated damp cloth, but something just, it's like a rag that is um, damp because of water. Also, I should say for those with small kids, um, same idea here as washing kids' hands before they eat. Um, that'll reduce their exposure to dust and reduce their exposure to um, these chemicals. And steer clear of products that are advertised as stain resistant. That'll actually um, avoid things like the PFAS or the fluorinated chemicals I just mentioned, as well as products that are labeled as antimicrobial. Again, the FDA has come out and said that washing your hands with regular soap and water is just as effective as using antibacterial products in your home. Um, in fact, they've banned triclosan because of that reasoning. They could not show that it was efficacious or more effective than regular soap and water. So steering clear of those antimicrobial or antibacterial products in your, in your home. Now, I, as we kind of wrap things up here, I don't want to leave you with the idea that the consumer can somehow choose, you know, get themselves out of this. In fact, all by themselves. In fact, we saw that with the bisphenol A, that people who say they avoid, people who think they're going out and avoiding BPA, they can't necessarily draw down their levels simply by taking personal action. So the, sure, there are several things that you can do and our app will help you to try to reduce your exposure, or limit your exposure to these hormone disrupting chemicals. That's happening at the consumer level, but it can happen what needs to happen is action at all different levels, from the consumer all the way up to the regulatory level. So yes, consumer choices, using our app Detox Me, um, making in informed decisions, following consumer, consumer campaigns about chemicals that might be associated with hormone disruption, things like that can be effective, but that's not the only thing. We need to couple that with um, actions at the institutional level. So this is things like, um, institutional purchasing, we're, fo we're focused on this in our project called Healthy Green Campus, we're focused on institutional purchasing and the impact of that on flame retardant exposures on college campuses. Scale that up even further to think about retailers and manufacturers, the importance of things like phase outs, things like the Mind the Store campaign, which is pushing pre putting pressure on retailers to um, uh, phase out or uh, eliminate some of these chemicals of concern in the products that they sell. And also we see that many manufacturers or retailers are actually seeing this as a marketing advantage where they are marketing, um, they're seeing an, an opportunity here to market products that are free of these chemicals. And then finally scaling that all the way up to the regulatory level, thinking about changing in standards and a things like a class-based approach. What that means is kind of not one-off. Let's not just ban BPA, but let's think about all of the chemicals that might be a lot like BPA, like bisphenol S, bisphenol F, there's P and there's N um, and AN. Um, and so thinking about that more as kind of a class um, rather than one chemical at a time on red lists or something like that. So thanks for your attention. I <clears throat> Hope that you'll visit our new website, um, silentspring.org. Um, also on our website, you can find more about our Detox Me Action Kit. The Detox Me Action Kit, I should say, because we had an overwhelming response, um, a number of participants signing up. We are actually right now, as I speak, on a pause, um, but we hope to reopen the study. We will reopen the study this fall. Um, so keep an eye out for that. If you go to our website, you can sign up um, so that on a waiting list so you can get a notification for when we open the study back up. Um, so I encourage you to check out um, that study site um, uh, to learn more about the research, but also to sign up. And I'm happy to take questions. Terrific, thank you. Well, you've actually leads right into the first question that came up, um, which was 
how many people can you at one time um, study in this in this um, di- yeah. detox me action now? How many can you actually um, address at one time? Oh, we can. Oh, we can handle as many as sign up. Um, we're ju- what I'm trying to do right now is trying to write up a paper. So it was I was trying not to have to coordinate urine kits while I was trying to write a paper. Um, so that's gotcha. kind of the, the honest answer to that. But we can take as many as as sign up. Um, in fact, the more we have, the better because that means we have more data to compare to, um, and we're learning more. Um, just you know, more diversity too would help. Sure. And, and um, I've got a question regarding the burden levels and if they're impacted by age. Are you seeing differences um, across age groups, particularly when looking at, um, I know you said you're now including children in the study. Yeah, so right now we don't have enough children, I think, to kind of do a good job of answering that question about whether or not children are different um, because we do well, we have a handful of children at this point although are enrolling children we started enrolling children later than the adults um, but we do see differences by age in fact and I didn't show it but yes um, for example we see that paraben levels tend to increase with age um, and that's could be just because people use more products as they age um, and um, we see other differences I I think we also see differences with um, uh, some of the bisphenols by age. But yeah, parabens are associated with age. They increase with age. And based on the feedback reports that participants are receiving, um, are they reaching out to you for follow-up? Yeah, so thank you. That's one thing I didn't, maybe you caught it on one of the screens, but I didn't quite mention is that that's also what's unique about our study is not only are we providing personalized study results to the participants, they um, always have the option, and it's clearly identified in their report, um, a number that they can call to speak to a researcher directly. Um, And so we've had, right, we've had over 700 people who've gotten their urine results, um, and we've had um, anywhere between, you know, 50 or 100 people that have actually reached out to us and asked us questions. Um, And I think that's really interesting in particular because we have people who are probably signing up for this thinking that they are low (laughs) in their levels um, because they're taking certain steps and things like that. And then they call us up and say, oh, why? what happened? Like, what's happening here? And we talk through some of these exposure sources in their everyday lives. I mean, I I talk, I, I, you know, speak to some of the people um, as well as our research director, Ruth Ann Rudell. And, you know, sometimes I'm on the phone and people are kind of just going through their everyday products to try to walk through some of these sources um, that they might have and they may not have realized that they have. Um, I also got a question here. Um, Let's see, I hope I'm phrasing this right. It says, are, are there, do you see that some population subgroups are more susceptible? It's all levels of exposure being equal. So I know earlier, you know, you were discussing um, black women, for example, and because mm-hmm. of the higher burden due to the hair care products. Is there any way of knowing if all levels of exposure, I know they're never equal because we're all using different products, but are there any subgroups of the population that tend to be more susceptible to the health effects? That's a really great question. Um, And I think that it is, um, there's a lot we're still learning about that. So yes, because genes have a role in this uh, too, this story is that many of these chemicals, it's not like, you know, uh, we're all different genetically too. So um, that there could be some interactions or based on certain differences in our genetics that could make somebody more susceptible. I mean, that's not necessarily going to fall upon, fall along race or ethnicity, but there could be say certain women who have a certain gene that might um, make say the metabolism of some of these chemicals different than other women. So yes, and I think one area that we're really trying to understand more of, and there's not a lot of research out there right now, is for example, why do black women in particular, they, they're, the prevalence of breast cancer is increasing in black women, but what is most striking is towards white women. So white women tend to have a slightly higher pre- a prevalence or now equal to black women. Um, and But what's striking is the mortality rate, is that uh, black women tend to be diagnosed with much kind of more um, 
lethal versions of uh, types of breast cancer. Um, and so the question is why? Um, and maybe there's some story there that involves environmental chemical exposures. Interesting. Okay. Um, pause just for one more minute to see if we have any more questions coming through. Well, Robin, thank you so much. Um, on behalf of Cheryl Osimo, NBCC's Executive Director and our Board of Directors, I want to thank you for taking the time to speak with us today and to share your studies and the information. Um, this has been really fascinating. Um, and I want to thank all of our many listeners um, for joining us today. For those who are interested, the recording of this webinar will be available later today on the NBCC website at www.nbcc.org. Um, Robin, thank you again. And to everyone, have a good afternoon. Thank you.